Good afternoon. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the SAT and the ACT. Um, going to get started in a couple of minutes. Just going to wait to see if anyone else or to see who else shows up. Um, so we'll walk through a little bit about what the tests are about, um, how to prepare for them, and just some strategies for test preparation, understanding the differences between the two tests so that you can make sure you make a good uh, make a good choice as to which test to use for your college application. If you have any questions, you can certainly use the question box, um, and those questions will come directly to me. The other members of the audience won't see them. You can also, at the end of the presentation, I'll also give my email address in case anyone has any questions, and you can feel free to email me. Um, great. So then we'll just pause just a little bit um, and wait to see if any, uh, who else comes in the room, and then we'll get started about 30 seconds or a minute or so. If you have any burning questions, now might be a good time to just go ahead and uh, throw out those questions, type them in there, that way we can have them already started. Um, by the time you know, we get rolling, I can just include the answers to those as we go along. All right, lovely. So, looks like we have a few people in here getting ready to, to party with me about the ACT and the SAT. So let me just go ahead and start getting, you know, get started. First off, let me introduce myself. I'm Akil Bello. Um, I've been working in test prep for about 20 years now. Um, I, I run a company called Bell Curves, and we provide test preparation to organizations and schools around the country. Um, so, you know, we know all about the SAT and the ACT, and we've helped people partic uh, pr prepare for them for probably about 13 years now. So, the quick and dirty on the SAT and the ACT. All right, some things to make sure that we keep clear right away. First off is, you know, the two tests are more similar than they are different. So, while you hear people talking about the differences between them, um, there are actually a lot of similarities between the tests. Um, so we'll walk about, we'll walk through some of the differences between them, some of the similarities, and hopefully give you some context for making a good choice as to which test is best for you. Um, in addition to that, colleges no longer have a preference or a bias about either test. So I don't know of any college in the United States who won't take whichever test you choose to take. So you don't have to take both the SAT and the ACT. Um, you can take one of them, prepare for it fully, take that test, and just be done with it, which makes your life a little bit simpler, not having to prepare for or worry about two different tests. So make sure you keep that in mind, that you know there's not a real need to take both tests, um, because most colleges don't care which one you do. They just want to see one or the other test. All right, and then, you, so you always make your choice based on which test do you think you're going to be best at. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about some ways to figure out which test you're best at, but you really care about which test you're going to be best at. Um, and if you do end up taking both, just spread it out. Maybe one in the spring and one in the fall. Don't prepare for both the SAT and the ACT because uh, together, uh, you know, during the same time period, because they're actually pretty, they're, they're weirdly similar, which means they're different, diff different enough that it can be distracting which test you're preparing for. Do you guess or do you not guess, right? Is skipping a good thing or not a good thing? And that varies from test to test. So you don't want to be confused about that going into your test day. So it's always good if you take both of them to spread it out as much as you can. All right, so first off, when you're looking at the test, they're not offered on the same days. So scheduling them becomes important. Make sure you think about you know, which test you want to take and plan that out. Um, the most popular tests tend to be those in the spring and then in the early fall. So March, April, and May are the three most popular test dates. The SAT is offered in March and, April, and May, whereas the ACT is offered in April and June. Um, oh, there should be, this check is actually in the wrong place. Uh, that should actually be there. And there should be no check for August SAT. 
sorry about that. So there's a June SAT, but there is no August SAT. There's actually no August test for you to reference. So the test dates are listed there for you, and you can figure out which test date to take. Like I said, the most popular test dates tend to be the May SAT um, and then the October SAT. And for the ACT, it tends to be October and April. All right, so what else do we need to know about the thing? So first, you're going to figure it out when you're going to take the test. If you're a junior, you're probably taking the spring test in your junior year, March, April, or May. And then as a senior, you take it again in October, November as a senior. Um, so, and that's whichever test you choose to decide on, whether it's the ACT or the SAT. And then if I was going to take the other test, let's say I did the SAT in May and then in October, I might do the ACT in November and December after I'm finished with the SAT. But I wouldn't do the SAT in March and then the ACT in April. That's just too close and too confusing. Um, all right. So then let's see what else we want to know about here. So scoring strategies, right? The two different tests have very different scoring mechanisms. So if you understand how they're scored, that can boost your score. Um, so what you want to think about is when you're preparing for the test, when you're deciding which test to take, you have to figure out how that test is scored and how to take that test to the most efficient and effective way. So looking at the scoring of the SAT, right? The SAT is you know, scored from 200 to 800, 200 being the lowest in each section, 800 being the highest in each section. So if we were looking at an SAT reading scale score, then what they do is they get a raw score, which is this middle column here, right? which they find by giving you one point for each correct answer and subtracting a quarter point for each incorrect answer. Then they convert that raw score to a scaled score, which is that first column there. Right? And that's the number that most of us know about. The scaled score for each section is going to range from 200 to 800 points. Um, so what does that mean to you as a test taker? Right? How do I turn that to my advantage? Well, if you have your typical person taking the SAT, what they do is they probably attempt all 67 questions. Get about half of them right, and then get about half of them wrong, right? leaving nothing blank. What that means is you end up with a raw score, right, which is not as good as it should be. Right? But, so if that raw score becomes a 29, from working on 67 questions, that's not great. Right? But if you change that around, if you approach it in a different way, if you think about the test better, rather than rushing through the test and trying to do the most number of questions, do fewer questions, like Jennifer here did. Jennifer only attempted 36 questions, right? Um, so if she gets 36 right, well, not attempted 36, but got 36 right, so attempted 42. Uh, fix that number, sorry about that. Attempt 42. Gets 36 right and 6 wrong. Okay. And then leaves the whole heap of questions blank, right? That works out in her favor because now she finishes with a 35 instead of that 29 getting a higher score, because that converts to a scaled score of 520, versus a 480. So the big thing about taking this test is understanding if I slow down, if I'm more careful, if I work on accuracy, not speed, I can maximize my score. So when you take the SAT, what you're really thinking about is, how do you maximize your score? How do you get the greatest number of raw score points with the least amount of effort? So for the SAT, overall, skipping is better. Now the ACT, on the other hand, doesn't actually score the same way. First, you still have a raw score, and we're looking at ACT math in this instance, right? So ACT math has 60 total questions. The scaled score goes as high as 36, so the scale goes from 1 to 36. So the way that they do it is, again, they get that raw score, but in this case, raw scores for the ACT don't deduct the quarter point for getting questions wrong. So in the ACT, the number of questions you get right is equivalent to your raw score. Right? And then they convert that raw score to a scaled score. Well, if we look at how that play out, you got your John again attempting all 60 questions, but John is your average student. So he goes about half and half. Right? Jennifer, on the other hand, slowed down and went more carefully, only attempting 41. Right? And so she gets a 
whole lot of questions right and very few wrong. But that means for the remaining questions, whereas John actually worked on them and got them wrong, right? Jennifer, on the other hand, just chose a random answer because she knows the ACT does not deduct points for wrong answers. So Jennifer's strategy is, hey, because I'm not a fast test taker, right? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work slowly and carefully and get the maximum number of points I can by being slow and methodical, which is a great strategy for some students. Well, at the end of the day, Jennifer ends up with a 37. We're assuming that she hit probability and of her 19, she picked up about five points, right? So she finishes with a math scale score of 24 and she attempted fewer questions than he did and got a higher score. So again, depending on which test you're taking and making your decision about the SAT versus the ACT is gonna be governed a lot by what kind of test taker am I? Am I a fast, quick, I do the calculations real quick and I'm in and out? Then I probably, it won't matter as much. But if I'm a slow, methodical test taker, then my strategy has to become really focused on the highest accuracy possible rather than attempting the highest number of questions possible. All right? Um, if you have any questions about that, feel free to just chat, drop it in the question window and I'll address it as we go. Um, so Jennifer is picking up five points on her guesses. She walked away knowing, you know, she goes into the test knowing that on the ACT, you always fill in every single question, right? You never leave a question blank on the ACT. Whereas on the SAT, that's not the case, all right? So other things to pay attention to is figuring out how to pace yourself becomes really important, right? The ACT is a much faster test, right? They give you about 19% less time per question in the reading on the ACT, and about 30% less time in the math, and then again about 20% less time in the English slash writing, okay? So the ACT is going to be a better test for students who can work fairly quickly. The SAT doesn't quite work out that same way. It gives you a little bit more time per question. All right, so when you're considering which test is better for you, you wanna make sure you understand you know, how the test is structured, how it feels. The ACT also has longer sections. So all 60 math ACT questions are in one section. Um, whereas the SAT, right, they, they have three separate sections of math. So you take a 25 minute section here with only 24 questions, and then another section with 18 questions with the SAT. Um, so you get a little bit of a break between doing all that math and the SAT. And if you like that, that's gonna to be to your advantage. If you don't like that, then the ACT is gonna be the test for you. So when you're comparing the two tests, you have to think about kind of all of those things. And we haven't even got to what do they actually test yet, right? This is just looking at the structure of the test, the scoring of the test, and how they're similar yet different and which one would be better for you as a test taker. All right, so other things to look at, right? So we know that the content is fundamentally the same, okay? They're fairly similar tests. It's really just the difference in how they choose to word their questions and the kind of style of the question. So one of the things I always think about when I think about SAT versus ACT is it's French fries versus potato wedges, right? They're both made from potato. They're both kind of the same thing but some of us hate potato wedges and love french fries or vice versa. Well, that's the same thing with the SAT and the ACT. They're really similar, mostly, right? They're based on the same stuff, but they play out kind of differently. You could even think of it as, you know, mashed potatoes or hash browns, right? Whatever, you know, whatever sort of analogy there plays out, it's based on the same thing, but when you look at them in practice, they're, they feel different. With regard to the math, right? The math topics are fundamentally the same. A lot of rumors out there about the ACT math being harder. It's not really harder, but they do have a little bit of trig and the SAT has none. For the ACT, you have a little bit of trig. SAT, you have no trig, but it's really only four of the 60 um, questions that are trigonometry. So it's not that much at all, okay? Um, so it's not gonna make a huge impact on your score unless you're shooting for that 36 perfect score, in which case it might make a difference. Let's look at what some of these questions look like. So on the left, you have your typical ACT question. And on the right, you have your typical SAT question. Right? And without even doing the math, the math here is fairly straightforward. 
One of the things you want to notice right away about SAT questions versus ACT questions is the ACT question is going to be a lot more straightforward, right? Here's an equation, solve for the variable. Whereas the SAT question, they've got a whole lot more going on. So people tend to say SAT questions are trickier, which is which is probably fair, right? They involve more thinking, they involve more, more recognition of stuff. It's less straight math and more of a reasoning test. So one of the differences between the SAT and the ACT, one of the things that you might want to consider when you're debating which test to take is, are you the type of person who sees the game behind the question? If you don't like that, then stay with the ACT. If you're okay with that, then the SAT may be better for you. Because if you look at this SAT question, they asked you for 10x plus 5y. Well, if you just think it's a math question, you might start solving for x and y. But if you recognize it's an SAT question, you should see that over here. If you just manipulate this so you can divide out the 3, right, then you're good. Because you don't actually have to solve for x, for x and y. You just have to solve for 10x plus 5y. So it's a little bit more straightforward, the questions on the, SAT, on the ACT than they are on the SAT. Um, someone asked, how long does the ACT certificate last for? I'm not quite sure what you mean by ACT certificate, but let me see if I can answer that. I'm going to rephrase it and then answer it. If I don't get your question right, let me know. ACT and SAT scores, they go on your record and they stay on your record for five years. After five years, the scores are no longer in the database, or it's a, it's a lot harder to get those scores sent to colleges. So for most students, the scores will be there on their record if they choose to send them off to colleges, all right? And they stay on the record for five years. If you are five years since you've taken the test, you might have to pay extra money to try to drag those scores back up. I know, you know I took the SAT in 1988, and I paid $55, I believe, to get my scores from 1988 researched, okay? So they stay around forever, but they don't automatically send them to colleges after five years, right? After five years, if you have Let's say whatever scores you have on record for five years, once you fill out the forms, if you don't use score choice, then they'll send those scores that are five years or younger. All right. Hopefully that answered what you were looking for. All right, so let's just look at another couple of questions for the SAT versus the ACT and how they sort of differ. Right? Um, so again, on the left, we have an ACT question. On the right, we have an SAT question. One of the things about the SAT versus the ACT is the SAT tends to be more Again, more trick-oriented, if you want to say it that way, more reasoning-based test versus the ACT, which is more mathematical test, right? If you look at the ACT question, it's asking for the approximate length of the hypotenuse. Using math terminology, it looks like what we're used to seeing in school. Well, the SAT question, on the other hand, um, doesn't actually say what it's looking for, right? But it kind of changes things around and actually um, so the, the style of the question is different. This one I'd have to use the Pythagorean theorem to find an answer. This one, I actually just need to know that 3, 4, 5 is a common right triangle that the SAT loves, and I can just jump on that and go forward. So the difference between the two tests, again, is one of style, right? The SAT is way more mathematical. I'm sorry, the ACT is way more mathematical. The SAT is more reasoning. It's actually less calculation. Okay, so what you need to do is just make sure you understand those differences because it changes how I'll approach the test. Um, again, pointing out the differences, ACT they say involves more advanced math. It does. It presents you with things like logs. This is a question that would never appear on the SAT because the SAT does not use logs. It won't test trig at all. But when you think about logs, this question actually isn't that hard. So if you have knowledge of logs, if you know how to put logs in your calculator, it's not actually that bad, which is why the ACT is so fast, because the questions tend to be relatively straightforward. So what you should be thinking about right now is, okay, given the style of questioning, is this something that's good for me? Is this something that I'm going to excel at? And which of these two tests is the one that I'm more likely to excel at? And that's the one I should be thinking about focusing on primarily. Um, and here would be an SAT style question. Notice it's wordier. In general, SAT questions are a little bit on the wordier side versus ACT questions in the math, right? 
it requires you to know things like the definition of reciprocal, the definition of remainder, right? Terms you may not have seen, you know, since sixth, seventh grade, right? So the SAT has more questions of this type where the scope of the question, right, requires you to go back to sixth grade, requires you to go further back in things you don't remember. The ACT is much more narrow, right? It tends to focus primarily, while it will use the word remainder, most of the topics are things that you've done in eighth, ninth, tenth grade, not something you've done in fifth, sixth grade, okay? Um, so again, that's one difference that may help you determine which test is going to be a better result for you. And that's really what you care about. You care about taking the test that will give you the best score to submit to colleges. Because again, if colleges don't care which one you use, you want to make sure you're sending the one that makes you look the best and makes your application as competitive as possible. All right. So if we look at the verbal end of things, right, the reading in the test, right, the ACT has reading comprehension, the SAT does as well. The SAT has vocabulary explicitly tested. Not just do you understand the words in this passage, but here's a sentence that's testing explicitly do you understand what these words mean. So dealing with the SAT if you don't have a strong vocabulary is a bit more difficult. And if you don't have a strong vocabulary, the ACT may be the way you want to go. So let's see what that vocabulary looks like. So one of the things about the SAT vocabulary that people tend to overlook is there's no real such thing as SAT vocabulary, right? There's English vocabulary that's tested on the SAT. So words that you see like intrepid, right, tend to show up on the SAT, right? Words like zephyr right, are things the SAT may use, right? So these aren't words that are, you know, pulled out of nowhere, but they are college level academic vocabulary. And that's what the SAT likes, Avenger, Skullduggery, right? They like to test words that you've been exposed to for soup, okay? That, and they'll put them in a sentence that looks like this, right? Forcing you to understand not just, you know, the, not just the, you know, do you know what the sentence says, but do you understand the meaning of these vocabulary words that they've put among the choices, all right? So to get this question right, you have to know what the word arid means, right? Or at least enough of the others in order to eliminate that, all right? So looking at this question, um, one of the things that are great about SAT vocab is, you know, if I understand how the test is designed, if I understand how to structure my thinking, I can realize that this question kind of gives away what's going on. Um, they told me that many ecologists attribute the dearth of bees in the northern hemisphere to global warming, which is a clue, right? Postulating that the unusually blank summer months have reduced the population. Well, if they're talking about attributing it to global warming, this word must mean warm, which means I can get rid of any answer choices that don't mean warm. If I know frigid, that's gone. Glacial, that eliminates. Temperate, I can get rid of, right? If I know what temperate means in tropical. So this becomes a real question of do you understand the vocabulary? SAT tests college level vocabulary. And you have to have an understanding of that sort of word, those sort of words, to do well on the test, or to do well on those questions. And it's about 19 of the 67 questions in verbal in the reading that will test vocabulary explicitly like this. So that's about a third of the test. So if you don't love vocab, if you're not strong with vocabulary, maybe the ACT is going to be a better test for you. Um, so here's another question, right? You can look at the choices. Take a quick second and see if you actually know how to do this before I tell you what the answer is. Okay, so what we should see here, right, um, so what we should know is that they gave you the clue, each was substantially distinct from its predecessors, which means they were defined as like different or distinct. Well, the only ch word among the choices, if you know some of these words, you can probably get rid of homogenous, right, which means the same. You can get rid of strident, depending on whether you know it or not. Restive would again depend on whether you know it. 
So it comes down to vocab. It comes down to how many of these words you know. And the right one is disparate, because that means different. So vocab, 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 vocab. The more words you know, the better you tend to do on the test, on the sentence completions on the SAT. Um, and again, sentence completions don't appear on the ACT, which, if you don't like vocabulary, is a great way to make sure that, you know, to, to kind of decide which test to take. In terms of the, the, the writing portion of the test, because each test has three components, right? The SAT has reading, writing, and math. The ACT has technically four components. There's English, math, reading, and science. Okay? And they both may have an essay. For the ACT, the essay is optional. For the SAT, the essay, the essay is a part of the writing portion of the test and is included in that 200 to 800 score. Um, most prestigious colleges, you know, Georgetown, NYU, things like that, are going to require you to do the ACT with writing or with essay. So if you decide to do the ACT, you'll probably have to do it with essay, um, depending on the schools, of course, that you're applying to. So you should make sure you check with your schools to see how they feel about the ACT essay. So they both test grammar. So let's look a little bit about what that kind of grammar is. Okay. Well, if we look at the rules, they both test verbs, and they specifically test things like tense and agreement. They test pronouns to see if your pronoun agrees with the nouns that it refers to. They both test modifiers, adjectives. The ACT tests what they call rhetorical skills, which really means the logic of how your sentence is put together and does it flow and make sense from one part to the next. And then the ACT tests punctuation, and the SAT doesn't test punctuation. So many of the things they test overlap. But again, it's that sort of weird, they're kind of the same, but not completely the same thing that's going on throughout these tests. There's a lot of overlap with some differences. So when we say grammar, right, um, a lot of people, again, will, will get all put up in, why do I need to know this, stuff like that? Well, it's, it's about communication. Right? And the grammar rules that are tested in the ACT and the SAT are rules you're going to need kind of forever. Um, I saw this ad in the subway, and it made me laugh because the grammar is bad. The SAT and the ACT both test modifying phrases. This sentence contains a modifying phrase, which includes arboristas. But because of the placement of it, it forces baristas to describe coffee, which makes no sense whatsoever. Coffee can't include baristas. So the grammar in this Starbucks ad, which they probably pay millions of dollars for, is incorrect because it violates a basic rule that's tested on the SAT and the ACT. So if you learn the grammar that's tested on the test, it's not just useful for the SAT and the ACT, it's going to be useful in life uh, because these are rules that, that come up kind of all the time. Um, and if we look at the next image, this is again something I saw in the New York City subway, the misuse of the word less happens all the time. You use less with things that are countable, like I have, I use less with things that are not countable. I have less water, you can't count water. But for things that are countable, like layers, you use the word fewer. So it should be I have fewer layers, not I have less. Uh, so again, grammar, grammar, grammar. They love to test grammar in the SAT, and obviously it's, it's relevant to writing. So here's kind of what they look like. Now, SAT, they have self-contained. Um, they have self-contained questions. So the one on the right here is your typical SAT grammar question. Okay, um, it is you know it, it is asking you to identify whether this rule is applied correctly, and then it gives you these choices for replacing the portion that's underlined. The ACT has something very similar. Now what we've done here, we actually cut up this question. With the ACT, this question would be part of a larger essay where they ask you about various components of the essay. So the ACT grammar is, is tested kind of in context, whereas the, whereas the SAT grammar is basically tested as a sentence at a time out of context. So ACT grammar tends to feel a bit more natural and normal and like you're used to, and SAT grammar doesn't. Also notice ACT grammar, the writing, has four choices, and SAT has five. It's not a huge difference, but it's a difference. Right? Um, someone asked, is it worth spending money on, I'm assuming you mean preparation. 
Well, if you're learning anything here today, and we haven't spent much time, right? We've been here for about 30 minutes. If you're learning anything here today, then think about if you had 20 hours, 30 hours with me, how much about the test I can actually show you. I could take the time to show you every single question, what kind of rules are tested. I can teach you what a modifier actually is and show you how to deal with that question in a large variety of ways. So absolutely, to prepare for the test is key, right? Um, you want to be able to not only learn what the test looks like, you want to learn the rules, the grammar, the math behind it. And while you can do that from, the book, from a book, it's often harder um, to do it from, you know, from a book because you can't ask anyone questions. So what I always think about when I think about test preparation is, will I be able to ask someone questions when the book or whatever's written down is not enough? Um, and I think that that's something that's worthwhile and that's something that you'll probably end up paying for. Um, the other question that came up was, is there going to be, uh, is dealing with the, tr the changes coming up for the SAT and the ACT? Whether they, when they make those changes to the SAT and the ACT in 2015, Actually, the SAT is going to be changed in 2016. ACT is going to be changed in 2015. Um, it's not going to be an issue for anyone now. They'll always have a way to compare the old test to the new test. So if you're a junior in high school now, don't worry about the changes that are coming up. Worry about what the test will look like when you're going to take it. Right. So no one right now who's you know a junior or a senior has to worry about those changes. Sophomores, freshmen may have to think about it because the preparation material that exists right now, the sample tests that exist right now, don't look like the test will look in two years. So there's gonna, like some of it will be the same. They're not going to change it completely, but some things will be different. So if you start preparing now, you have to kind of focus on the core skills more so than the question types, because the question types may change. All right, so the last part about the ACT that we haven't talked about is the science section. The big thing to realize about the science section of the ACT is it's actually not real science. What they tend to do is it's not testing your scientific knowledge. What it's testing is your ability to read charts and graphs. So if I look at this question, based on the information in Table 1 and Figure 1, what's the, the lowest boiling point at which, is at which the following aptitude? Well, to answer this question, all I really have to recognize is jump here and show, sorry. All I have to recognize is this is giving me altitude. This is giving me pressure. Oops, I have images blocked here, so let me just go back. Well, pressure is connected here. So they're giving you a way to connect the two charts that allows you to say altitude leads to pressure, pressure leads over here, this leads me to boiling point. So it's really just a question of reading charts and graphs. Right? And that's what ACT science is about. It's not really about science as much as it, is, as it is reading charts and scientific graphs. So when they say ACT science, don't sweat it. Don't worry about it. Make sure you practice so that you're used to it. But it's not scientific knowledge. You don't have to know how to find you know, velocity, and it's not all the physics terms that you have to know. It's really about reading charts and graphs. Great. Um, other things to be aware of, both tests allow you calculators. So you should have your calculators, you should have your pencils. They don't bring any of those things for you. So great similarities between the two. But they have different rules for which calculators are allowable. Um, the ACT bans one model of calculator. I don't remember which one offhand, but it's one of the TI models. Um, the SAT, I don't believe, bans any models that, as long as it doesn't connect to the internet. So you have to make sure you know the rules for calculators, for ID, uh, for all of those sort of things, because you don't want to be turned away from the test because you brought improper ID, or because, you know, the calculator you have is not allowed on the test. All right? Um, so, preparing for the test. Let's kind of wrap it all up with thinking about how do you prepare for the test? What are the things that go into test preparation, right? Um, so, ACT versus SAT, right, each of them have, um, each of them have a preparation book that's available to you, okay? So, um, the, that's what's in the images here, right? You have the SAT study guide, the ACT study prep guide, 
they're not really prep books as I tend to think about them. Those are practice books, right? The SAT, um, ACT, the company that makes the ACT, and College Board, the company that produces the SAT, put out practice books. Books which contain um, practice questions, but not a whole lot of strategy and overall review. So make sure you distinguish the two, right? In terms of figuring out kind of, again, which test am I gonna take, what am I gonna do, right? What you have to think about is like, how do I prepare for it? Which test am I gonna make sure I prepare for? How much time is it gonna take me to prepare? There's different levels of preparation. If you just do a practice test, you will become familiar with the test, which will make you better prepared than if you are unfamiliar with the test. But that doesn't necessarily mean you know how to do every single question. A workshop like this has given you some familiarity with the test, but it doesn't really prepare you for the test. So you have to start thinking about how long am I gonna prepare, right? A month, two months, three months, and think about it in terms of that. Um, if you're gonna do a course or hire a tutor, then you'll probably get given the guides, but you should definitely think about what type of materials am I gonna use if I'm gonna study on my own, then you have to get those guides. That's a great place to start, but it's probably not all you're gonna to use to prepare for the test. So, so you have to think about how do I learn the rules that are on the test before I go into one of these practice guides um, and start practicing questions. I need to learn the rules first. Uh, all right, some other resources. Um, there are great websites that are out there. Um, the, question, the SAT College Board and ACT on their website both have a question of the day which makes sense to start doing and practicing if you are getting ready for the test. You can have, you know, you can just go to the SAT every day and do a question, and that'll give you a way to get ready for the test, right? There are different websites that are out there. For vocab, I love free rice. It gives you a vocab quiz. It lets you donate rice to, you know, poor countries around the world, so that's kind of cool. There's a few different vocab sites out there. Um, you know, so the, these are different websites. There's our website, which has a lot of information on strategies and ways to approach the test and things you should know, like how do you get a fee waiver for the ACT versus the SAT, right? Um, also from ACT and, a and SAT, you can download a free practice test from each of these, which is the best way to figure out which test you should take. You go to SAT, you download the free SAT, you take it, you score it, take an ACT, score it, and compare them to see which test you're better at, right? If you look up a concordance chart, C-O-N-C-O-R-D-A-N-C-E, if you Google SAT, ACT concordance chart, that will give you a way to compare your SAT scores and ACT scores and see which one is better. And if your ACT score is way better than your SAT on your practice test, then you just prepare for the ACT and take it. and Don't bother taking the SAT, right? That way you give yourself less work. You don't have to prepare for two tests, you only have to prepare for one test, and you prepare for the test that you're more likely to do well on. Okay. All right, what else do we need to know? Any other questions so far? So you should have some sense of what the difference is between these two tests, right? And once you have a sense of what the difference is between these two tests, and if you've taken a practice test, you can make a better determination of which test is going to be a better test for you to present to colleges for them to consider you for admission, right? Um, the other benefits of the ACT, there are a few other benefits of the ACT over the SAT. If you take the ACT, some colleges will no longer require you to take SAT subject tests. So schools like, um, let's see, Harvard, I believe, requires not only SAT, but if you submit the SAT, you have to submit two SAT subject tests. But if you submit the ACT, you don't have to submit subject tests. So some colleges, if you submit the ACT, they'll waive the requirement for the extra subject test, which is a great benefit to save yourself potentially another three hours of testing by taking just the ACT, okay? So ACT offers a few advantages just in terms of like those kind of logistics, right? But if you're not going to do well in the ACT, then those advantages don't really help you very much. So you got to think about kind of which test is going to play towards your strengths as a test taker and let that kind of judge and determine which one you should do. And I think the best way to do that, again, is to go to either SAT, you know, the College Board site, or go to ACT student site 
just download that practice test, take it in your home, score it by yourself, compare the scores, and see which one you do better on. All right. Um, other things you need to know. So, the company that I work for, Bell Curves, right? We run SAT and ACT courses in tutoring, and we have online courses as well. Um, live online courses so you can communicate in real time with your teacher. So if you're looking for preparation options, if you're looking for information, remember we have a blog with a lot of information. Um, we have actually one of the newest blogs we posted was the SAT ACE essay versus the ACT essay and how those essays are different. So we have a whole blog series on SAT versus ACT. So it would be great for you to check that out if you want more resources. You can also look into the, the options that we have. Any questions? We had a few questions that we answered as we went, but if there are any other questions, it would be a great time to just post them up there. All right, no questions? So if there's no questions, um, I hope I've given you some context for, you know, understanding the differences between the two tests, um, for knowing how, you know, which one is going to be better for you and how to figure that out. Uh, if you need more help about that, then feel free to send me an email. My email is just akil, A-K-I-L, at bellcurves.com. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, you can also go to our blog. And there's, the, like I said, the whole series on ACT versus SAT. And you can go to actstudent.org and download a full practice test and find out what the test looks like. We have lots of resources to help you figure this out before test day rolls around. And if I can be helpful with that, please let me know. So if there are no questions, I'll say thanks for participating, and have a good afternoon.